Hello, I'm Harry, uh, your host at Epistemi Entrepreneur, uh, the podcast Hello. dedicated to scientists, entrepreneurs, and deep tech startups that will change our lives. Uh, today, I uh, have the pleasure to have as a guest Dr. Sebastian de Lanschir, system biologist by training, founder and CEO of Deep Bio Modeling, a startup founded in 2020 in Luxembourg. Uh, if you allow me just to introduce what is system biology, because uh, I'm a molecular biologist by training, so you know there's kind of opposition between these two era. So as opposed to historical approaches, which tend to break down the study of at all levels from organ, tissue, uh, to cells and molecules, system biology uh, is the computational and mathematical analysis and modeling of complex biological systems. It's a holistic approach to study life. Are you agree with that? Yes, um, something that people can usually relate to is that when you have a complex systems with plenty of parts that have a, um, a, a specific function, you can study the whole the, the whole set of all of these molecules and functions, but that sometimes does not predict how the whole system will react. And, and this is basically what uh, a lot of living systems are based on, is this, this intricate uh, dance between a very large number of, of uh, actors in order to self-regulate and reproduce, etc. So systems biology is like trying to understand how this works really at the macro level. With the help of uh, computer science and, uh, and statistical modeling, right? Sorry. With the help of computer science and, and statistics and uh, mathematics. Ex exactly, because like standard biology, you can figure out the function of one protein, but if you have thousands, it, it's much more difficult. You need a good computer. You can do an analogy with uh, trying to understand how a clock uh, works. You know, you can you can uh, disassemble all the clock, all these pieces, and look at. With the microscope, all these pieces, but you don't, you, but you can't understand how the whole thing works. Exactly. The, 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 there's a well known article saying that if a, um, a biologist would find a, a radio, he would not understand what it's used for, <laughs> but he will understand every single part what, it's, what yes, it does, exactly. but he doesn't know how to use it. So I think this introduction put uh, uh, the system biology in place. It's a very important field and very, very emerging, right? Yes, well, it has been around already for a few decades. Okay, because uh, 20 years ago when I finished uh, my PhD, we, we, we started to hear about biostatistics, bioinformatics, but you know, uh, uh, it's very, I, I think your, your field is quite, quite an emerging field because uh, uh, when I started my, 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 my study at university, we, we didn't know this field at that time. Well, systems biology is, is basically rooted in theoretical biology. Like, you know, these this very old papers trying to, to figure out what the equations of, of life yeah. <clears throat> in the like 50s and 60s. And um, with our increased understanding, and, and we know way more uh, proteins and genes than we know before. So the, 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 the idea of systems biology is, has been known for decades, but it's just very difficult to do because there's so much that we yet don't know. So everything we try to, to do and predict is always inaccurate. And hopefully like more and more accurate as time uh, advances. Um, but yeah, so it's a work in progress. So before we talk about more deeply about uh, your startup, let's talk about a little bit about yourself and your path into uh, the STEM uh, uh, study at the university. Uh, why is STEM particular? Well, do, do you have a particular attraction to mathematics or to, to computer science or life science? Uh, well, yes, and actually, since I since I was a kid, I was I was very passionate about uh, uh, sciences, not really mathematics, but more about like uh, uh, astronomy and like uh, everything like a, a science kid would be interested in, and. Um, I remember that one of the things that really fascinated me was uh, poisons and drugs and anesthesia and, and all of these like uh, molecules that influence the, the, the human body. And um, when I was going to the pharmacist as a child, I was really um, 
under the, the I was amazed by all of this uh, cleanness and all of these little boxes and vials full of deadly molecules. And um, yeah, pharmacists also know everything about plants and they can recognize toxic mushrooms. So it, 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 it sounded more like, a, more like a superpower to me. And, I, and since I was a kid, I, I basically imagined that I would be a pharmacist. So when I was 18, I started to study pharmaceutical sciences. And uh, while at the university, I realized that the coolest part was actually being in the lab and manipulating all of these dangerous liquids and living materials growing. And uh, so I switched to medical biology in uh, still in Brussels. And, uh, and I became a lab technician. I worked for about a year in a number of um, startups and, and hospitals in, in Belgium. Then I found um, a good job at the Institute of Immunology in Luxembourg with um, Professor Claude Muller. And I worked there for seven years. And what we were doing there is actually very rele relevant to uh, the, the situation uh, now because the subject was uh, molecular epidemiology. So we were sampling viruses from different um, places in the world and try to uh, infer the shape of the epidemics and the, the drivers of the, the evolution of the virus, identify new genotypes and uh, variants um, that would uh, somehow escape uh, the, the, the immunity and trace back even the ancient history of viruses. Um, so that was very, uh, very interesting. I really enjoyed that. And during that time, I start to become interested more about the uh, mathematical part of the work. So when you have sequences, there's a whole uh, theory about how to infer the phylogenetic tree of, of, uh, of a set of sequences. So what is the genealogy that uh, um, uh, generated the sample that you see right now. And, um, and there are very um, specific mathematical ways to do that. And, um, and I became very interested in doing that and started to play around first with Excel, then so with some visual basic and just trying to learn by myself uh, and rediscover these, uh, these principles and then I started to study them. Then I realized that uh, this is what I really wanted to do. So I went back to university for a master in systems biology at the University of Luxembourg. Um, after which I took a one year sabbatical, I traveled to India and Nepal and uh, like the standard sabbatical things. And then I started a PhD in systems biology, uh, which I finished uh, about two years ago, and then a short postdoc in the same research group. Uh, you finished the postdoc and then you you uh, started the company or started the company last year in july after the the end of my postdoc okay okay and um, so and um, what about uh, the, the business opportunity or the desire to create a startup was it something that emerged during your phd or your postdoc or, or, or all along or is it something completely different or Mm, it, it kind of emerged during my postdoc. I, I, I never imagined that I would be uh, um, that would qualify to be an entrepreneur. Um, well, that, that was not the the, the goal. Um, and I I kind of realized that there was a business opportunity. I thought a lot about it, and then I decided to make the jump and see if if. Um, there was something to, to be done there. And um, so what I realized, if you want to talk about what, what, what my company is, is doing. So you, you, you mentioned that like 20 years ago, there was a big rise in uh, bioinformatics. And, um, and the reason for that is that there was more and more uh, sequences. We drafted the human genome 20 years ago. Um, and uh, so there was a need for more and more Techniques. The techniques that were available at the time were not sufficient. There was a need for new algorithms, new um, new ways to treat the, 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 the data and to, to ask the, the relevant questions. 
and there was kind of a 20 year um, development of this with more and more teams really dedicated entirely to bioinformatics. Um, private companies started to make software that was uh, relevant and, um, and also research groups started to make um, contributions that um, most people could then use and then the, 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 the right techniques or method could propagate and then be built upon. But the first few years were very uh, chaotic and you had a lot of um, teams that were developing their algorithms and they were not systems biologists or bioinformaticians, they were just biologists like fiddling around with some code and uh, they could solve the problem, their problem, but nobody else was able to use their code or apply it to their data. And um, so a lot of papers were basically not reproducible and a lot of people were basically rediscovering the same things and re-implementing the same algorithms until at some point one implementation was really solid and could be used by another scientist. You know, if, if you have a, some processing step to earn your data, you would basically want to know exactly what the computer is doing. If you don't understand the code, it, it's more safe to just write it yourself. And, uh, and to some extent, the same thing is happening again now. Now you have um, a huge number of advances in machine learning, deep learning, and in general, like advanced statistical models that are applied to a number of fields, uh, computer vision, and, and, and like lots of things that, um, that are uh, implemented on, on the internet. And, um, and there is a need to transfer that to biology. And the same process is a little bit happening again, like some now bioinformaticians are uh, trying to uh, implement these uh, deep learning algorithms and these uh, um, complicated statistical analysis themselves and uh, they are not always successful and uh, so one way to solve the problem is to hire someone that really knows about the problem uh, but that's not always possible for that. Sometimes they have a, a project where they have a specific problem that they want to be solved, and there's just no one in the group that has either the time of, or the expertise to really do this well. And there are no, well, there are very few um, private companies that are able to answer such a level of uh, customization of the client needs. You have a lot of bioinformatics companies out there but they are going to uh, generate the data, do some basic pre-processing steps and uh, some basic analysis. And if you have a very specific question and an algorithm to implement, they are not going to do that. So, so I think that in the, in the near future, well, I think I'm, I'm kind of uh, starting this uh, trend, there will be uh, more and more, um, how do you say, uh, opportunities for this type of specific consultancy in, uh, in research groups, both private, um, private groups and also public institutions will need some very specific talent and they will not have the opportunity to hire um, a postdoc for a year, especially if you put the, in perspective the, the competition that there is between, for example, uh, private uh, public institutions and uh, large companies like Amazon. So if you are a, a very successful machine learning engineer, you probably work for a, a large company like this. So it's hard for um, biology research group to hire this type of talent. So what I would like to propose is um, to have this, this talent, to have this level of customization and, and attention to the, the client need, um, but on a, on short-term consultancy mission. Okay, uh, so you you start uh, the design of your business model right now, if I will understand. So uh, how, the, how does it work? Uh, 
first of all, who, who, who are your ideal clients? Are, are they a research group, public research group in, in academia, or are they a uh, big pharmaceutical company, or big, big biotech, uh, private biotech, uh, or both? Um, and how do you work? Uh, is it something that is a craft made? You need to be behind your computer and doing the job, or be doing the math, or I don't know how it works, or, or do you have a or do you design it a software that can be implemented as a SaaS? Or? Uh, I, I, this is still uh, in, in the conceptualization uh, uh, mode. At the moment, I'm, I'm trying to give a chance to everything that you have mentioned. Um, my my um, best customer, uh, I don't know if they would be private or, or uh, uh, public. I would expect the private um, companies to be uh, a bit more harder to work with, although they might pay a little bit better. I, I don't know. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm fundamentally an academic, and I like to work with, uh, with academics that are really uh, passionate about their research, and they know their subject really well, rather to work on a pharmaceutical product. It, it, it's a little bit more uh, short-sighted. I think I, I, I would really love to work on something like fundamental physics or something like that that doesn't have uh, an application and to really contribute to the uh, core of, of science. It's an interesting positioning because uh, it's like being a, a, a science as a service, you know, for the scientific. Work. Yeah, exactly. That's um, th 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 that's another definition of uh, SAS. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it, it's a little bit that. And you see, in in, in that um, in that ecosystem, you have some companies that are going to run your clinical trial. There are some companies that can yeah, provide some statistical analysis of your data or something like that. But like really, like taking care of you have. An, an algorithm and now you want to distribute it to the world, you want to make a web application or something like that. Uh, that does not really exist to my to my knowledge. But I, th I think there is a real need for that. And concerning uh, what you can bring uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as an output for the research group, you know now you, 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 you told us that there's um, now a lot of data from genomics, from transcriptomics, from uh, proteomics, and now from even uh, glycomics and metabolomics. You know, the, now the omics is everywhere with all of data with different levels of data. You know, from the gene to the macromolecules, etc. Uh, do you think that your uh, expertise can um, help scientists to, to bring uh, some outcomes that we couldn't imagine? Uh, that the molecular biologists like me couldn't imagine to, 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 to discover, you know, with your help? Um, I'm not really looking for outcomes that um, cannot be imagined. Like, I, I don't know what you, what, what you would let, have. Let, let, let me explain further. For example, um, we have two cell lines, and we do a comparative transcriptomics between uh, uh, the cell A uh, with the pharmacological uh, treated with the pharmacological, pharmacological drug versus mm -hmm. you know the control, and we do the uh, the, the comparative transcriptomics, and then we see uh, which one is up and which one is down. And then we, we, as a molecular biology, we will, we will focus to those who are up or down and say and say, oh look, look this molecule has a role, etc. You know we are, we are still focused on our uh, on our how can I say. Uh, like a single Reduc gene reductionist, yeah. a reductionist way of uh, working, even you know, we use transcriptomics or an omics approach. The yeah. I want to I want to know how you can help me to to have a, another breed breed of of, of you, you know uh, of this kind of data. Well, the, the the goal of course is to is to integrate all of these biological levels, but the, but that's a that's an old problem. There's a 20 years that people try to integrate proteomics with genomics and every other paper will tell you that you can totally predict protein concentration from the transcriptome and the next paper will tell you that it's completely, completely wrong and I don't think we came to a conclusion for that. So, so th th there are still lots of things that we ignore 
about how cells uh, function. So the, the, the goal indeed is that if we integrate genomic, transcriptomics and proteomics, that would already be something. And then we can include all of the, the other ones you mentioned like um, metabolomics and, and lipids, et cetera. Um, th that we could have an insight on some higher level process. Like for example, if you, if you um, well, I give you a stupid example, but if you uh, do com comparative transcriptomics on two cell lines and you see some sets of genes that are uh, uh, overexpressed in one case, you can look at every single gene in particular and say like, oh, maybe we should uh, don't regulate this one or this one, but you can also analyze them as an ensemble and say like, oh, well, we see that this type of pathway in, in general is a little bit overactivated. Like it could be uh, proliferation or it could be like apoptosis is, a, is a, uh, inhibited in a cancer cell line or something like that. And these might not be things you, you could see with a single gene but more of, of a generalized integrative uh, approach. General, generalized behavior of the, the cells or the tissue or the organ, whatever. Uh, it's very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, and do you have some uh, recent uh, discovery based on your, your, your uh, era that is uh, very, very remarkable? You know, something that I can, I can say, uh, wow. <laughs> Uh, you mean in the company? No, no, in the in the system in the system biology with the system biology approach, you know, some, something that is very uh, yeah, that okay. we couldn't well, we couldn't envision before with, with the molecular approach, for example. Well, one thing that I um, that I've been working on during my thesis is to um, to to understand mechanically how cancer works, and um, well, of course, that, that's also a very old uh, uh, problem. And so far, you know, when uh, a drug is being developed, this is the, pro uh, the, the result of a process where uh, you identify a target which you want to interact with, and you know this is going to be your target. Uh, and then you develop molecules that are able to interact with, with that. And then finally, you develop a, a, a product. And um, the... the um, the thing is that we have now a huge amount of anti-cancer uh, drugs and a lot of people don't respond to the drug that we thought they would respond to, some patient relapse. And uh, there is no huge effort uh, in the field and I think it's going to be complete in the next few years where we can analyze um, the different mutations that the cancer uh, carries and also the, the, the signature of genes that are expressed or not, the, the phosphorylation status of different proteins and uh, put everything in an algorithm that can then form a prediction about what drug or drug combination a patient should, uh, should uh, take. And there are no clinical trials that are uh, ongoing. I think Germany is quite advanced on, on, on this and there are several cl clinical trials uh, running. And uh, so I think in 10 years when you, um, well, I hope you never develop cancer, but if you do, you, you will have a biopsy and they will measure a lot of things, way more than they do at the moment. And you will have um, uh, a protocol that will, that will be tailored for your cancer with your genetic background. The mix of molecules. Um, because it, this is a, a paradigm shift, you know, because the reductionist approach needs to compare one molecule to another molecule in a very specific. So if you add a, if you add a, a, co a complex mix of molecules, you know, it's completely, um, it would completely freeze the mind of the of the scientific uh, approach right now because it's based on the reductionist approach. But the systemic, uh, the systematic approach, the holistic approach that you are promoting right now. Uh, is also um, pushing to us to change our paradigm of, 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 of medicine. Yeah, and, it, and it's not going to be easy to change the paradigm of uh, clinicians who have who are the ones who are in the end responsible for uh, treating the, the, the patients. So in the end, it's a little bit of a, a leap of faith. You know, it's a bit it's a bit like self-driving cars. 
you know, you are in your car and it's driving yourself and maybe it's driving into a wall and you can't do anything. So you have to trust the computer. And you know, the computer is, is very complex and, and no engineer can go inside the algorithm and tell you why at some point the car took that decision. And um, that's annoying because when there's an accident, we want to assign some responsibility. So, but if say we develop self-driving cars and we start to have 100 times fewer accidents, then we are kind of forced to accept that. And, and, it's and the proof of the concept, yeah. Exactly. So I, I, can, I can see a, a stage in the future where oncologists are going to do that. They are going to have maybe several algorithms giving them predictions and they are going to uh, take decisions on the patient and they will sometimes say, ah, why would that work? Why would that drug work in that patient? But all of the algorithms concur, so let's try it. At the moment, they would never do that. Okay, great, great. So uh, right now, so you are planning your business model. You are starting an interview with the academy, uh, right? Uh, to see if there is, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, a response from them to, to buy your service right now, or, or you already have some clients? Sorry, sorry, we have a little cut. Sorry? We have a little cut uh, from the video. Do you hear me? I'm back. Uh, I hear you. Yes, you're back. Okay. So I was just asking about uh, your, your 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 development stage. Uh, so are you uh, starting to interview uh, the? The, the laboratory would be interested in your service or, or do you have already some clients and how does, how does, how does it work? I, I have some, I have a, a few clients and uh, at the moment I don't have a very precise communication or marketing strategy and all of my clients basically come from my network. So people and labs which I've worked with before, I collaborated before and um, so it's more something between them and me and they know what i'm capable of and uh, yeah so i i i'm running these these uh, uh projects uh, at the moment and i've not yet uh actually had a client that i did not know before uh, if i uh, if i imagine uh hiring you if, I, if i'm a uh principal investigator in a laboratory uh, in the any uh, academic institution. If I hire you, uh, in fact, it's very interesting because uh, I can I can have your expertise more rapidly than if I feel uh, feel good here for for you know for having fun and hiring a postdoc, you know, etc. It takes a lot of time, but mm -hmm. I can hire you just as I can hire uh, I don't know like, uh, I buy any product or anything which you know so. Is this also something that you push when you interview your, your network? Exactly. And um, I, so, yeah, just as a service, you can you can start and say, OK, this is my budget. Let, let, let's try. And if you're not happy of the service, you just uh, you, you just stop. You just you don't need to hire someone and then you're, you're stuck with someone or sometimes the project is finished and then you don't know what to do with that person. And you, or, or you don't have yourself the capability to really manage that, that, that person. If you have a scientist that's solving a problem that you did not know how to solve, you have to be able to understand what the proposed solution is. Otherwise, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the cost time. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, th I think this is a, a way of working that is going to be more and more common in the future. And actually what some labs have started doing is to hire people for a, a small amount of time, uh, but with no, um, let's say, no, no uh, end of the contract. So I, I have some, some uh, people I know that work as a bioinformatician for half a day, 
and the, the client knows that yeah, you, or you have a bioinformatician very specialized for half a day. You can ask questions whenever you want. And, um, and you always have this small amount of uh, expertise, but maybe that's what you, you, you need. It can be a game changer in the project because you can, you can definitely uh, bring a lot of uh, value in a specific moment. Uh, if you allow me, maybe last question about uh, your, your startup. What is your uh, ambition or vision about uh, about uh, video modeling? Uh, is it to stay as a contract research individual or become a research a contract research organization hiring people, etc., or, or even moving to a SaaS uh, uh, service uh, with the software or something like that? I, I'm planning to grow the company um, in in 2022, uh, hiring uh, one uh, scientist. Um, I'm writing a grant now, and so if it gets accepted, I will be able to, to hire someone. Um, not really extending, well, I'm, I'm already working uh, for a client in Germany. Um, as far as I know, I could work for anyone in the world. I don't need sure. to be phys physically present for the type of work, so that's a big advantage. I could actually be on, <laughs> on the, the, the swimming pool. And in a, in a sunny country, and still still do the the, the same job. Um, so yeah, I, I don't expect to remain as a single person company because, of course, I I, I have the expertise that I have, but uh, this is a, a, a thin uh, sliver of expertise in uh, all of the clients' needs. So I'm actually. Uh, declining jobs at the moment because this is completely outside of my uh, field of expertise and I don't feel confident in, in doing that. So the goal, yes, would be to assemble a team of uh, specialized consultant that would um, have a complementary and synergistic uh, fields of expertise in order to be able to answer more and more of the client's uh, needs. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have one advice to offer to, to, to younger students in STEM, uh, if they dream to, to launch our own company and start what, what would be uh, your story or advice? Um, one thing that I really regret is that when I was in a PhD student um, and postdoc in the pre-pandemic era, I did not connect more with people. I went to countless conferences and I just stayed in my corner or looked at the poster uh, or talk with the people that I already knew because I'm shy and uh, it, it's really important to get out there, shake some hands, connect with the different professors and, and get in the known of what really what's going on. And as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of things that are happening because people know people. So if you are well connected, you're likely to have a a lot of help and, and free uh, advice and, uh, and and more clients. Absolutely, I totally agree. I also advise any every student to understand to to just knock at the door of uh, of the incubator of the, of the university and try to connect with the CEO because they are just a little bit older than themselves and to to, to have the, the, the fresh feedback from them for their guys in, in the incubator and the and they can help them a lot to, to, to open their minds in the, in, the, in the new era of opportunity. Yeah, exactly. And in that regard, the, the incubator is also doing a good job in, in connecting the, 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 the um, uh, entrepreneurs and the different startups with the main actors in, in Luxembourg. Okay, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to have thank you today. You. And uh, we follow uh, your, your company carefully because it's a very uh, important era and uh, I wish you uh, all the success. Thank, thank you. you very, thank you very much.